So, uh, yes, so what, what I'm going to be talking about is specifically looking at the ethics within uh, uh, visual psychology, and particularly mental health research uh, within visual psychology. Um, so thank, thank you to Diana for, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was a problem. So thank, thank you to, for Diana for a, a very good introductory um, presentation because I think now we can see some of the concept that Diana presented um, applied to a specific way of doing research. Because obviously there are some uh, um, generic ethics when we do mental health research, but then depending on the specific method used, being a quantitative method or qualitative, uh, within these methodologies being um, more some, some, something more structured, uh, something based on a group, something based individually, something creative, like the kind of research I do, the specific ethics then will have to be um, modified and adapted. So I think this would be an example about how to apply uh, the principles of ethics that Diana expressed uh, to a specific methodology, in this case, using visual method. Um, thank you, Vulan. Uh, so traditionally oriented visual disciplines, uh, being anthropology and sociology in particular, but also, although to a lesser degree, also psychology and geography. I'll take some break because I know you're translating in Basel, in Indonesia, so. In fact, my, my, my own education, as a, um, I know that uh, Vulan was looking my my biography, so I think I didn't get there, but my, my background is in visual anthropology as well as cultural psych uh, psychiatry and psychology. So bringing together some of this um, uh, learning from different disciplines in uh, my own research. Actually, I guess I would like to you for maybe stop for a few seconds. I don't know if you people can now, I can ask questions when I want, right, right now, because they don't have to go to a quiz, yeah? So I can also prompt new questions, right? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, so can you take out this slide and just uh, ask people if, if uh, so take out the slide so people can see the answer, if you can go back. Uh, pardon? So you want to can ask? Go back. <laughs> Oh, go back. Okay. Just go back. Yeah, so there is mm -hmm. no answer. So given it now, now it's easier for people to be writing in, a, in, a, in this pair, pair up. Um, just I want to know when people think about visual methodologies in mental health, what, what comes to mind? What do they think is visual research method uh, within um, psychology, uh, but particularly mental health research? In which way visuals can be used? Visual methodologies can be used. Okay, so you want to ask uh, yeah. the participants to write. Okay, I need to. Yeah. to they can write or they can, they can talk if they, they feel like sharing their voice. Okay. What, what, what is the question again? Is when, when the audience thinks about the word the visual, um, the visual methodologies in mental health. So when they saw the talk that I was going to be giving about ethics in, in, a, um, in a visual mental health research, what do they think about? What, what is uh, visual methodologies in uh, mental health research? What is a re research methodologies in mental health research? Hmm. What does it mean? Yeah. Apa aja, uh, apa aja research methodology dalam mental health research? Menurut Silakan. Apakah uh, bisa dijawab? Sudah bisa dijawab? Belum ya? Belum, Mbak Ulan. Tadi harusnya mm -hmm. ngasihnya tuh. Ini nyuprom gitu. Belum, belum di, sebelum di-share. Tapi teman-teman bisa ini. Oh, share di... Silahkan, isu sensitif. Yes, silahkan ah. bisa dijawab di chat saja. I... I never heard of visual psychology. This is my first time. Yang lain, yes, silakan. Yes, you're correct. Lita, Lita, Lita Patricia, in fact, it's a word that I kind of started using with my colleague Susan Ansen at Middlesex University. It's not a concept they really use. So we, in fact, are kind of setting up um, the sub, this sub-discipline in ourselves at Middlesex mm -hmm. University. Because um, usually people know about the visual anthropology and visual sociology. But there is actually scholars like myself and my colleagues at Middlesex yeah, University yeah. doing visual yeah. psychology research. So. This is what we never heard before. We also <laughs> do, doing an end book about it. I will tell something more later. 
So Alifa says photos, pictures, yeah. So maybe try to think, okay, so we try to think about using photos and pictures in, in, uh, in uh, um, mental health research. In, in what way, in which part of the, uh, how could you use, how can you use visual methodologies like photos, uh, uh, videos within mental health research? Audio recording? Usually in visual psychology or visual mental health research, there is always the visual component. The audio might be there or not, but the visual component is that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Ika says the, this method can be used to interpret images. So, okay, so it can be a process of interpreting images. Again, and others say that it's their first time. Is sorry? Uh, it's their first time to hear the method here. Yeah, good. CPMH is very open to new things, so you're, you're part of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can be uh, using visual media in psychological research, yeah. And to and analyze photo, film, or video towards yeah. the expression of a human behavior. Okay, yeah. I mean, that, that's a good start. So, uh, Bolan, if you can go to the slide you were showing before, are we, are we sure there is different ways in which, in which uh, uh, visual, visuals can be, can be used in, uh, um, oops, to close the chat, in the, within visual psychology. So, uh, researchers as well as practitioners um, recognize uh, that images can play an integral role in the research process in different, in different ways. So, diff there is this different way in which uh, both uh, still images like photos and moving images uh, like video um, can be used. Uh, somebody would painting, and I said, yes, so visuals can, can also include the drawing, painting, um, objects and themselves. I, I will focus mainly on uh, images, still images of photographs or moving images, like uh, short videos or full length film, okay? But, for, but can also apply to uh, um, pictures. Um, so some of the way in which uh, uh, images can be used in the research process as to be, to be fair, um, begin with is to identify research priorities and define research questions. So we could be using some images like photographs um, with participants in a community to choose together what we want to focus on, what are some of the key issues for the community and help us to define as a research question. So that could be a creative way of involving communities. We can also use images, both still images and moving images um, produced by participants as data. So participants are given cameras um, or using their mobile phone today. You know, in Indonesia, many areas where I work, people seem to have pho phones that can take um, photos and short videos and people can be using that to be um, producing data. So they collect the, the data that they share with us. Also found or existing images can be used um, also as data. So instead of asking participants to produce data, we can uh, use already existing images, for example, from the internet or, uh, um, or photographs we have taken as a researcher and asking people to then comment on that. We can use this for building theories uh, and also to evoke uh, other data, yeah? Images can also be used for feedback and as well as for documenting research processes. So we have got some kind of documentation about what happened in the field. And often when we do field work, we already are doing that. We take images to documenting um, what we actually have done. They can also be used uh, for interpretation and representation. So helping us to interpret data we may have collected using um, another kind of methodology. But also this is something that for me very, very important that we can use images um, for disseminating uh, our research. So as, as you um, will be aware of yourself, you know, often research um, tends to be something that the, the data collected, the findings are only shared between other academics or policy makers, but audience becomes very, very small yeah, for, for research. While, while if you use uh, images, uh, photographs, particularly video, then we could use um, what we have produced as a way of distributing um, the research findings, communicating the research funding to a larger audience, and particularly um, in my own case for advocacy and activism. I'll wait for you to finish. No, no, take your time, so I want to make sure. If there is any question or anything I said isn't clear, um, do please uh, write, raise your hand or write in the chat so we make sure that 
you all are um, uh, understanding what is pain because as you said, it's something new uh, from probably for most of you. So I want to make sure that, um, yeah, that you're learning what you, that is the basic and you can ask any question at any point. Otherwise we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jika ada pertanyaan atau yang ada yang kurang jelas, silakan bisa uh, di kolom chat ya. Nanti kita akan uh, Bu Ermini akan menjelaskan kembali. Kalau tidak ada, kita lanjutkan. Oke, okay. all good ini. Now, so for something in Proxer and Loxley wrote, wrote a uh, report about visual research methods more in general, they wrote due to the relative newness of visually oriented research, the, we, have, we have a limited agreement among ethics committee and visual researcher on guidelines and best practices in terms of visual, uh, visual ethics. It is clear um, that around the world, the funding bodies, university, um, the kind of authorities are only now beginning to considering establishing some kind of visual ethics policies. But this is not easy. Yeah? And I want to take you to some of the complexity. But obviously, as I was mentioning before, as um, today's, um, you know, most people do have uh, mobile phones. I would say most everywhere, but certainly in urban, more urban um, settings. And there is a lot of sharing of images. And obviously, this is done in a, in a private way or in a, in a uh, out of the research environment. But then it also gets reflected within the research. That's why it's important that we start developing uh, visual ethics when it comes to research, because of the big presence of images in our daily life. And uh, what we expect is that images will progressively be more and more used also for research purposes. As we are becoming visual, visual communities, particularly now with COVID, our communication has uh, largely changed. Now, psychology, as I mentioned before, while visual anthropology and visual sociology are quite well established uh, discipline, um, uh, visual psychology is actually something is very recent and use, use of visual uh, or images within, within psychology, something that has been part of psychology for a long time, but has not been as developed as within anthropology, um, geography and sociology. So psychology still has to develop his own specific ethics guideline for visual research method. For this reason, psychologists are undertaking visual, but more generally any arts-based research, draw on, on ethics guidelines, which have been developed um, in other disciplines, particularly within visual anthropology and visual sociology. But I want you to um, reflect and share about what you think might be some issues around the psychology, um, uh, uh, people doing research within psychology, particularly mental health research, who might be using guidelines of built within a visual anthropology and visual psych sociology. What might be some issues with this? No. Yeah, so the, the, the slide before was showing a question. So I'm asking what, do, what people think that they can share, what, uh, what do you think might be some issues with the um, people doing research in mental health, in particular within psychology, um, in terms of adopting guidelines which have been developed in other disciplines. Do you see any problem with it? Okay. So the participants can answer in the chat. No? Yeah. Yes. So I think the, the people here thank you, are answering more about what are issues around visual ethics. My question is more about at the moment, but keep on your, your, your question was more about, would you think it's okay for people working in mental health psychology to use guidelines from other disciplines, like anthropology, sociology? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Or you think there are some issues with that? Apakah boleh uh, penelitian psikologi itu menggunakan panduan dari ilmu lain gitu dari uh, antropologi atau dari sosiologi apakah boleh atau adakah isu dengan itu silahkan Bapak Ibu bisa menjawab di kolom chat
Would you think, Bapak Ibu? Okay, I mean, it's okay if people don't have an idea because I realize it's something quite... Um, you. It's, yeah, so let's look at the next slide. So yes, there are, there are, there are um, okay, Anto says, thank you, Anto. Uh, yes, we can, but we need adjustment. Because yeah, we do need adjustment. So uh, uh, if you can go to next slide, Gulan, please. So my, my colleague Susan uh, and, Sam and, and myself uh, have written very recently um, a paper which is around titled towards the development of ethics guidelines in visual psychology, a review of relevant visual research ethics guidelines. Then in this paper, um, we have looked into what actually are existing guidelines. And as I just mentioned, um, uh, there is nothing specifically for visual psychology or for visual um, uh, mental health research. And, uh, and therefore, uh, we are indicated you know, the need, uh, given the specificity of psychological research, to be able to um, look at guidelines that are more discipline specific and have to um, use guidelines developed in other disciplines. So this is a paper I'm going to be referring particularly in this presentation today. Yeah, so Anna says, it's fine, anthropology sociology also studies human, but we need adjustment for specification in our research, exactly, because yeah, they, although they are social sciences, a humanities discipline, uh, psychology's topic are, can be particularly specific, um, and uh, uh, the kind of theories that we use as well. So we need to have something which is developed uh, within our own field. In fact, uh, visual researchers who are doing research in psychology might find it difficult to um, use the ethics guideline designed for traditional psychology research. So we are in a difficult situation because if people working within visual psychology, and when I say visual psychology, I want to say people are doing uh, psychological research, which is based on using visual methodologies. Yeah? So people are using visual methodology in psychology find it uh, difficult because if you look at the genetic guidelines like that Diana was referring to for more traditional research, Research, many things in these guidelines don't, don't apply to creative methodologies, don't apply to arts-based methods, that, that do not, not apply to visual methodology. I mean, or they, need, they need, to, need to apply with adaptations, yeah? Um, so why psychology ethics guidelines have been adapted to encompass uh, talk and text-based qualitative research pro projects, visual research projects present also more additional um, kind of challenges. Can go to next when you finish translating. Yeah, I'll check the chat if there is any question. Okay. Okay. So our recommendation was that uh, um, we kind of need to expand some of what we already we know, um, and uh, and uh, and also expanding not to, to think beyond just the participant. When we think about visual mental health research, we need to think about also the audiences, and I get to that in one second. Um, we also to think about the rights of and the risk to the various parties involved. Um, it must be considered in all stages of the, the research. And this may include the participant as producer of images. So as I said before, a participant actually themselves um, are using cameras, video cameras or uh, photo cameras to be able to produce Im images. And the, the issue also around ownership is very important because in this, in this context, then it's also about who actually has the copy so to speak, who is the owner of what is being produced, the participant, the researcher, the institution, um, also the rights of the individual and communities captured in the images taken by um, participant or the researcher, but also the impact of the research on the audiences. So there is three very complex aspects of this. Eh? So one is about ownership, one is about rights um, in terms of the, the people who are represented in these images, but also the impact the images can have on audiences, because obviously showing a uh, uh, 
a photo, sharing a film can have a very strong emotional impact compared to sharing more traditional um, research, particularly like, you know, if it's quantitative, so numbers don't have particular emotions to them, but also qualitative research might have a, a, a less um, impact than uh, using a, an image. So we need to think about impact as well. I think there is a little quiz for you. I don't know if I'm going to explain how to do it, but uh, I want you to, um, and some of you already shared some of this in the chat before, but the question is now, what do you think are some of the ethical issues to be considered doing a visual research in psychology? And again, I think I want you to think particularly within mental health. Um, and how do you suggest that this can be addressed? Jadi, Bapak Ibu, why menurut Bapak Ibu menjadi isu etik isu etis yang harus dipertimbangkan dalam uh, penelitian visual di psikologi dan bagaimana menurut Bapak Ibu ini bisa di diaddress gitu. Kita akan melihat bisa ditulis di ini ya Bapak Ibu di peer deck ya. We will see some response response. So here are some response, Amy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at the application to see what people have to do. I was very curious. Informed <laughs> consent, impact of images, participant, emotion, feeling, privacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What to consider about, and I think that's been still filled in. Privacy, how different the reaction can be triggered. Emotional impact, emotional effect. Yeah. If you also want to write in a uh, bus Indonesia, uh, our wonderful Vulan, we or somebody will translate for me. So don't worry. Write in whatever way makes more sense to you. Images can be blurred. So yeah. So they talk about so confidentiality issues, but uh, a solution is images being blurred, the voice alterated. Yeah. <laughs> In focus and and the media that we used. Yeah. Okay, somebody about the benefit wait, wait, because all the stigma impact from the visual sharing, so potential is generating more stigma. Yeah, benefits for participants. Okay, thank you for having something positive. They have an expectation how they will be represented based on what they have seen on the internet or the media. Yeah, so people might think when you're using cameras, what you, the, your outcome is going to be what they see in a mainstream TV. And mainstream TV use of visual and research use of visual are not at all <laughs> similar. Like they shouldn't be. Okay. Emotional okay. effect, we will help with that. So emotional impact okay. is something that you seem to be. When to give informed consent, yeah, that's an important point. We're gonna go there. Okay. Different the action can be triggered by the visual cue. Okay, research must prepare themselves to help participant face impact. Okay. Okay. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so you did, did uh, I mean, they, they give much solution. So some of the issues, as you can see, were the same or what Diana spoken about before, but then we have to think about um, um, other elements uh, because obviously uh, one image, um, once it's out, is a, uh, is out, and that is something very important for to be aware of. Uh, that once uh, once some which um, data has been produced and, and it's been shared, then we have no control really about um, where, where it goes, where it ends. So there's a lot more complexity uh, with it. Okay, next slide, Ulan, please. Okay, so yeah, this is what I just asked to say some, some, of, some of the issues of, there's a lot of, of, a lot of aspects of research ethics and Diana did indicate quite a few of them. Um, I won't be able to go cover all of them in our presentation, but I think we could, we'll cover a few of the important issues around the visual research ethics applied to psychology, particularly to mental health. No. 
Okay, so one aspect that you mentioned was about consent, and Diana spoke around consent. Um, one issue I, I found doing research within um, a, a visual, visual mental health research because of the pot potential impact further implication of um, uh, images being shared, uh, staged consent um, is, uh, I think, uh, whenever possible, a very good way to go. This basically means that the consent is renegotiated at different stages of the research process. When we start collecting data to when we uh, are um, you know, ready to screen uh, the visual data or do an exhibition. Uh, and so it's not just a one-off process. So when we think about consent, we think about if something happens in one stage, as people for participation. But with visual, visual research, because of the potential impact that the, the release of the visual data can have uh, on the person as well as the, the community and on the audience, um, whenever possible, it's important to try to have a staged consent or at least to be in touch with the participant so that they have an easy way um, to withdraw the participation or decide to change what they've consented for. The BPS, the British Psychology Society, um, Human Research Ethics, particularly re recommends renewing of consent for uh, um, uh, work where there is a considerable time commitment, particularly like longitudinal studies, where we may work with people for many years and we want to renew the consent to make sure that they are still okay with it. But I think also many visual research projects, um, because between collecting the visual data, like Diana was talking before about our project in Indonesia, um, luckily that happened just before COVID, in fact, um, in October 2020, and then, mm, we started doing it, 19th. Um, and then um, we finished in January 2020. Uh, and now we are uh, one year later, we still have not released as of our visual um, movies. We started releasing some of the movies. So, you know, it's not very longitudinal, but it's still enough length of time in between the start of the process uh, and now. And, uh, um, and so, uh, this kind of guidance around using staged consent for visual research project, I think is particularly important between um, mental health research. It might not always be possible, but wherever possible, it, I, I think it is the only way to go. And if you go to the next slide, uh, when, once you finish translation, I'll show you some examples of, uh, um, of consent form release form I've used in my own project. Let me see this thing in the chat. If you have any question, remember to just raise your hand or um, write in the chat. So yeah, next slide. Okay. Okay, so we, we have a question here around, um, I, I wanted to touch, imagine you are doing a research um, in a, a rural area of a lower income country, it can be Indonesia or another country. And I want you to think about what might be some of the issues around consent that you will be facing. Again, and, and I want you to think about what might be some issues, um, but also thinking about how you, you can deal with them. Oke, jadi silahkan Bapak Ibu mencoba untuk membayangkan jika Bapak Ibu sedang melakukan uh, penelitian visual di perdesaan di negara yang berpenghasilan rendah. Apa saja yang uh, mungkin menjadi isu yang dihadapi dan bagaimana Bapak Ibu uh, akan meng, uh, menghadapinya? Let's see some response. Okay. So then I'm going to vote in the chat that the people might be low educated. So lack of education, maybe comprehension, we need to explain it very clearly, difficulty understanding the content of informed consent. So we need to assist them and make sure that they understand it well. Language gap, very important. Mm -hmm. The tools, I don't know what the person about in the tools uh, camera meant. So can you maybe explain more? The benefits versus risk. They hesitate to join our <laughs> research, <laughs> research because it makes it takes much <gasps> working their working time. Okay. 
they might not have phone number. Okay, so some, some of the things that you're writing up to start with type, so maybe, okay, find number to contact these artists. Yeah, okay. So it could be something that then to be able to be in touch. That is a very important issue um, that you are mentioning there. Where, unfortunately, I can see the names here. So, but um, the um, phone number can be an issue of contact because in a staged consent process, um, you need to be able to go back to the person. And there are many situations where you might not be able to contact somebody from over, overseas or even nationally, the person might be moving, they might not have a mobile phone or, or mobile phone might be changing, so we might be unable to get in touch with the person. That's why I was saying stage consent is important. I, I find it's better to... Um, to um, you know, to 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 act as a potential aim, not telling as a restriction. In a moment in which we said we are we going to contact the person again before we release the film or before we uh, distribute images, that means if you are no longer able to contact the person, then we don't know what to do. So in my research process, I project I prefer to tell the person that they can get in touch and and the, the search team, like in this case Asti, who is also here with us and uh, Diana, try to get be in touch regularly with the community. So that people can withdraw if they wish to do so, um, but not making that as a condition. Because otherwise, then if we can contact the person anymore, then we might withdraw their data, but the person might actually want to still be part of it. Um, uh, behavior, social culture. Okay, understanding of the aim of the study. So we talk about rights, and this is very important. So when we go more in areas where maybe people are not are, are not really exposed to much to visual data now, saying in Indonesia, my experience has been that most people uh, are, have mobile phones or have a TV, and they might be able to understand, like when you talk about making a movie, what you are talking about. But still, we need to make sure that people are understanding the implication or the consent. Uh, and uh, and so they, they, their rights are protected in terms of not being accepting to be part of a research without fully understanding the use that it will be done or the image that the, they have shared. Um, but also understanding the benefits of using the research. And I find this important using visual methods because it's so much more complicated. It's more complicated at getting at this e clearance. It's more complicated getting get the permits. I've done two research in Indonesia applying for visa to do research once they asked me a journalist visa and the last one was a research visa and uh, um, which asked the, uh, luckily was with me for a month in, in Jakarta to clear everything, but it's extremely complicated. Um, and uh, because there is the complexity of using uh, cameras to collect data. Um, mm. So it's important to understand why you're using camera, why you're going to the, to the complexity of it, what are the benefits of this. Cultural gap, economic gap, inability for them to imagine what is exactly. Yeah, so if you can show them, so if you're using film, usually people are more uh, understanding of what you're gonna be doing with a film because most people, even people are low educated, watch movies. When you talk about a photo exhibition or other kind of arts-based thing like theater or uh, um, a storybook, um, a graphic novel, you know, what they're using, people are less educated, might be less likely to have been exposed to that and maybe not fully understanding. Cultural, cultural norms also very important. Money, I'm not sure what you are meaning there, if you can tell me something about money. Trust, trust, trust is very important in all research uh, that we do, particularly mental health research being very sensitive, but with visual mental health research, because of the nature of the method we are using and the potential distribution of the images, trust is particularly important. And, and I find this particularly important also that um, because people might be trusting you, they might want to disclose more that they would otherwise do. So it can be also be a double sword uh, situation where we need to make sure that people are not over disclosing before they trust us. So that's why it's important people always understand that whatever you are capturing will be going um, online or to festivals. So people have to be able to not, not share more that they, they feel comfortable with in terms of uh, what they share in front of a camera. So the consequences in joining as participant. Okay, I think that's all. Okay, so very, very good point you made there. So I'm very glad you, you produced a lot of good reflections. 
And this is just an example about being in a rural area. But obviously, as, as I said at the beginning, the particular method that we use require an adaptation uh, and particular consideration in terms of um, uh, ethics, but also the particular setting where we do research. Because in the moment in which, as I mentioned, we use, for example, uh, videos um, as a research uh, um, uh, methodology, uh, the, the, there will be a difference between urban and rural or higher class or more most educated and, and, and less educated or whatever. So there is a lot of, of situation around the context we have to take in consideration when, we, when we're doing research. And also power, because obviously um, there is always a power imbalance between us as a researcher and the, the participant, but this can also feel more increased when between you and the person there are potential camera because it can put you in a particular um, status towards them. So the situation of power needs to be very well considered when we are looking into um, people giving consent. The power of bully. Ah, yeah, it's the power of bully <laughs> included. <laughs> so these are some examples of, of, of a series form. So this is a, from a project, and maybe Elulan, if you can then after this show the movement website where people can see the project I'm referring to. So this form here was for a project called the Free from Pasung. Uh, originally, then became Breaking the Chains. It's a, it's a project, a visual anthropology project I've done. Um, started in 2011 and uh, uh, looking around Pasung uh, in Indonesia and what actually are some of the activity taking place in the country, particularly um, following a, 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 a organization, which at that point was, was uh, um, I mean, it's based in Changjur and I went to see them again for last project. So in this case was the, my, my, I had to apply for ethics to the anthropology department in Manchester University and um, I think in anthropology, because there is a longer tradition with the visual uh, methodology, they were all happy for just having a plain language statement, which described what we were doing, um, but also just having this kind of release form uh, where people had to simply sign. So what you see is quite simple and the people had different um, uh, things where they're consenting to, but there only, only, only was one signature to make. Yeah? So, I wanted to, to compare this, this release form, which is kind of as a consent, but it's, it's more, it's, it is what we use as a consent, because it was a research project, but realistically, it's much more a release form than a consent form, in the, in the way we mean it in psychology. Yeah? So for example, you can see this is what we use, it was a use for a visual anthropology project. And I want you to now show the next slide with Vulan about our current project that Diana mentioned, where we are working together. No, no, this is actually another form, a, a kind of a, sta a little st staged um, consent where people are given only two boxes where they to choose either one or two or three. So it's a kind of little progress where people have to consent to different things, but there is only three options. And then show the next one. And this is a concept form we are using now uh, as part of uh, the Together for Mental Health project. But you can see um, people, instead of just signing one thing at the end, people are given at least three pages of this, in fact, um, of the many different options, where for each one of them, the person has to tick yes or no. So instead of just having, having one consent about everything, people have to choose for everything if they want it or not. There can be something around, uh, including if they want to disclose the age. I'm not that we are planning to disclose people's age, it's not important, but sometimes could have been relevant. Maybe somebody mentioned, you know, now, now is for he or she is 40 and something. Maybe the person didn't want the age to be said, yeah? So people, to, in case the age was shared, they have to say, okay, I want to, I'm okay to share my age. I'm okay to share where I live, the town, the village where I live. Um, I am okay to... Um, to uh, be recorded, uh, but also can I use, can the audio be recorded? Do I want somebody to reenact re what I say and the voice to be modified? So for anything, do I want my name to be used? Do I want a pseudonym? So for every single thing, the person needs to say yes or no. Yeah. So you, you don't have just one signature at the end of everything as in the form I showed you before, the first form I showed you I used for breaking the chains. In this case, it's more of a staged consent, not for term, for time, but in terms of there are different stages of consent and people have to decide what they want to consent to and what they don't want to consent to. And again, ideally, um, we will be in touch with the people in some sort of way to see if there is any aspect of their, their agreement that they wish to um, change. Um, 
in positive or in negative before the release of the video. I said it's not always possible. Well, whatever we can, we try to um, double check the person is still happy to go um, ahead with the uh, initial visual consent, visual research consent. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, please do, yeah. And then, then after, Bulan, if you want to show the movement website so people then can go and uh, um, oh, yeah. uh, check with the project I'm talking about. Uh, okay. Here, can you see my screen? The movement. Yeah. Uh, which one of it? The conditions is that the tension to get a comment on it. So, the name of it was the website museum freshman.org. The name of the project project, the Ermenia Kulichi. Ada yang break ni tu James yang tadi di diceritakan. Yeah, thank you. So breaking the chains is there. You can you can actually watch one of the of the film and I can hear my voice, which is very scary. <laughs> I don't know why I can hear my voice. Can can no? Oh, okay, now it's gone. No, it's still there. Yes, but maybe we'll want, if that maybe you can, can you try to, to, to see if you can mute? No, no, if you mute me, then you don't hear me. I can tell if it's really disturbing. There's a delay. What yeah, about okay. now? That's gone. Can you yeah, that's gone. So what? The, no, no. Back. If it's like I'm, I'm meeting somebody's computer, repeating what I say after I say it. Really? Hurry there. Okay, now it's gone. It's okay, okay, now, now it's gone. Who is and okay, so no, 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 it's back again. Okay, okay, no, it's very disturbing. So I can hear myself after I speak, so it's a uh, very disturbing anyway. Um, yeah, so the um, uh, breaking the chains, you can you can have a look at that, and then also the met the, the project with um, Diana together is that as well. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to sign up for the movement.org as well, you can have updates when we have events, or if there is any visual uh, project going on. Um, oh, I wish I didn't hear myself talking. Mm. Okay, so next slide, Bulan, please. Yeah, okay, I, I had to mute it, so um, I don't hear myself. There was the only way to know to stop hearing myself. If there is anything important to say, please uh, write in the chat because I now I can't hear anything. So if you speak, I don't hear anything. Okay, so this was the, the, the presentation from before, the concept form from next.
So one issue that was raised in the example I was giving around doing research in rural areas was around um, people literacy, education. And uh, uh, as also was mentioning by, by Diana, there are situations where the consent cannot be given um, then because the person might be uh, illiterate or having a very low, low um, uh, level of education. Now, one issue is not only about the signature only, about somebody cannot sign. There is issue really on not being to fully understand Inside, what one way you should do uh, in this case is talk to read the pain, uh, the pains, the that you need some of the terms for somebody is difficult. So that's to time, but to. The last project together for mental health, um, the voice is unclear. And to say, can you can you hear me? Can you, you okay? There is a delay. Yeah, just okay. now you, you mute oh. like you freeze. Did I freeze? Okay. Huh. Yeah, but now it's okay. Is it better? Better, better. Okay, I wonder why, what happens, okay. So I don't know what you followed with that, but I was talking about different way. Okay, thank you for the, the good news. Uh, let me know if there is any other issue, but I hope um, you, got, you got the point around um, that it's more than just having a, um, a to sign, a consent, a consent uh, form is about fully understanding what's in the consent form. Alternative to use the, um, uh, the thumb, uh, is about uh, I mean, the person reading uh, or saying something in front of the camera where they actually saying what they are consenting form. So that is a form which is more accepted. And now that, that we are with COVID, we cannot meet our participant and the interviews are done online. Some way people are doing this, having consent is through other online forms um, or through the person stating in front of a, of a like Zoom meeting like here uh, that they consent and then there is a, a recording of what the person consented to. Okay, I can't see the slides anymore, uh, Wulan, but if you can go to next. Is the audio okay? And if you can show the slide, Wulan. Hang on, Wulan. Sorry, sorry, the connection is... Right. What we call a connection problem. Share the screen again. Okay. So thank you. So next one. Okay. Now there is quite a lot here, and I think maybe we don't want to take too much time, but. Uh, um, Something very important when we do visual any research, but I find the visual research in particular is around um, if uh, 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 using uh, the privacy issue. A lot of you uh, showed about privacy confidentiality, and but it's a very uh, difficult balance around the the, um, the um, benefit and risk of anony anonymization versus identification. Okay, so why the like, society is like the British pathological society, I'm talking about British because I'm based in UK, I teach in London, um, but you know, you can see about anybody relevant to you. Usually, um, uh, I mean, what BPS suggests is, is a reasonable, a reasonable balance 
between uh, protecting participants and recognizing agency and capacity. And I've been, you know, all my mental health and suicide prevention research I've been doing for now more than two decades. Um, this has been the hardest thing I have to deal with is in terms of how can we make sure that we are balancing so that while we are protecting participants, so we are protecting their rights and we are making sure that they are, uh, there is no uh, unattended um, consequences for them taking part in research, we also recognize them are, are agents which have ability to um, capacity to make to make choices because of, 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 uh, very often when you when you work with people with uh, um, mental illness um, uh, or social behavior the assumption is they might not have capacity and while it's true that some people might not, not have capacity um, uh, usually is not all the time and so people uh, even with severe mental illness can have, have capacity maybe they just and when they're very unwell they're unable to make decisions um, but people most people are able to make decisions if they are, are explained um, about what's going on. So how do we balance so that uh, we're protecting participants, but also allowing them to have agency about decisions uh, that are as important as participation in research, in particular in visual research. Uh, so uh, in terms of protecting identities, BPS advises researchers should ensure that individuals are not personally identifiable, uh, except some rare circumstances. But the code also states that where a participant wishes to have their voice heard and their identity linked with this, researchers will be able to respect such wish. This is a very, very, very important point. And I, I, I want you to be aware when you do any kind of research that you should not be taking the consent uh, in terms of privacy confidentiality to mean that you should always, pro always protect the personal identity. You should give people choices uh, in terms of um, if they want to share their identity, what they want to share with an identity for them to make a decision. Uh, and, uh, uh, but obviously also make sure that they have the capacity to do so and not assume that somebody just because they have a diagnosis or mental health issue means that they are incapable to make decision. This is not the case. You can go to next. Yeah, so this is what I just said there now. That there is a, that's an assumption that all data should be anonymized. But um, these are issues around that as well. Sometimes people like using visual research, the, um, the, uh, the option people take is about blurring out images or pixelating images. Um, but sometimes that's honestly not enough because you could still potentially identify participant. Uh, maybe if the person said something of the context, their family is shown, people can see be able to identify the person. That's why I find it's a better, a better way for me during research, try to not involve people unless they, they are willing to um, um, be identified because there is always a little bit risk of being identified. Uh, but in some cases, obviously, um, uh, accept to just have to blur the images or try to sometimes I film people in a way that you cannot see um, their face at all so that you don't have to blur them and maybe just try to focus on them so you cannot even see the families around them. Yeah, next. Now, again, the, the point I just made before, but Mitchell also argues that anonymizing visual data may not always be the most ethical course of action. Okay, so it's a very important point. This, and I think applies to all uh, visual, uh, all mental health research. But uh, when you talk about visual mental health research, obviously uh, the assumption can be that is better not to show the images. But this is yes, assumption, and also by researchers, um, I found myself. Um, but it's not always the case. In some cases, my pose a threat to the benefit of the research for participants because we are not showing their faces, but also might take away the sense of agency for the person, um, the potential empowering impact that doing research can have on the person. And this is uh, particularly so for a participatory project where the participant participant want for the work then this is to be recognized uh, to have an impact in audiences and communities. So I have found a lot of people wanted to wanted to show their identity, want to make sure they want people know who they are because they wanted to have an impact. And I, after asking permission to um, Anton to share, I wanted to ask maybe Anton if you want to share something about um, your experience around being involved in the Breaking the Chain project. And, uh, um, uh, and and your choice around sh showing your identity and uh, what that meant to you. 
um, so any reflection you can give from the perspective of uh, uh, research ethics in terms of your own involvement in research. Can we give Anto? You can choose. You can choose to show all your, your face or the audio, whatever is best for you. I'm showing my face now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Hello, I everyone. To... I would like to Hello. greet some of the uh, person that I know, Pudiana, of course, and my friend at CPMH, and Mas Johannes, I saw Mbak Julaiha, the, the one that people that I already connect with. First of all, I remember the first time when I signed the consent that you gave. I mean, the short version of the of the informed consent that signed in 2012. Then at, at the first time, I joined uh, as a participant. I know what research is, but and I know the consequences of the of the joining research because I decided to not be anonymous and I will like uh, show my identity. And because I have the, you know, to the world and want to talk about my experience, that's, that's the one uh, reason why I want to join this, the research at back then and, but but I know also the consequences, uh, and I was ready, and and then then that's why without any like, uh, uh, I mean I understand I and I, I agree to join the first then then I signed the in about like uh, involving audio video movie uh, using this kind of method into the like a mental health experience related to the person live with experience because uh, it is important for the participant to to know to understand to acknowledge to uh, to be aware of the consequences and and so that's that the first thing that needs to be considered in my opinion and so far because i already aware of everything and like uh, calculating the the what will be and so so that's why so far I'm so good because because finally I I gained a lot of support although there was no agreement about like after the movie finish I will be uh, like uh, protecting you or contacting you or everything no it was not mentioned but but I'm just like ready and and I in 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 the journey uh, until at this time i had a lot of support from everyone which is i think all of the researchers should consider to support the the participants if at least if there is any impact so so the the researchers should, should provide like a, a mitigations like a, a, an effort to what would what would they can do in case this participant going to be impacted uh, like uh, psychologically or, or any situation because because in mental health we in Indonesia for example we are related with a high stigma so so we have to protect the participant from gaining the impact for this stigma I think uh, that's my experience so so I, I was I was glad that I joined the the research I am in mean the the movie and finally uh, by the process in 2012, finally we collaborate to write, uh, and we decided to write the my story into a journal, which is that's something uh, like the app, uh, like additional research that I join. So, so as long as the participants acknowledge what the the consequences and 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 get the support for the you know negative impacts of this or, or side if impacts of this project so th everything will be fine so that's my experience thank you emmy for joining me the research and hope to <laughs> collaborate in in further research in the future same here. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. I know we didn't plan this, but as you were there, I thought, you know, what what best better way to learn about visual uh, research ethics and having uh, participants 
who is now a friend to be um, involved in uh, describing their experience. And I think the points you are making are extremely important um, around support and something actually I was uh, chatting with uh, our researcher Asti before around the importance of having support. And obviously as a researcher, we might not be able to imagine if you have to support all the research participants uh, after research is finished. So, you know, it just uh, uh, realistically is hard. Um, but uh, um, making sure that there is somebody who's going to support the person uh, uh, during the research process, but also once the outcome of the research has been published or has been shared, that is going to be somebody supporting them. So that's the minimum you, you have to do if you're unable ourselves. Um, to support the person. So, Can I add thank something? Thank you, Anto. Yeah. Can sure. I add one more Go point? On. Like, yeah. Uh, sure. Related to the ethics in research, actually in my campus, we have like a one specific course that require all students before taking the projects. We have to finish the training on ethics. So we have the certificates to finish. Like, we, So we have uh, the rest of the projects are like like a minor of or or a big uh, going to be like a, you know hazard how how's how the negative impact of the research i mean the risk any risk like the level of the risk and everything so so i think it's important for all of the students that's going to take the mm. research they have to finish the training and get the certificate mm. i ask my, my question is the are uh, the campus in Indonesia do the same thing so so that mm. we are already literate with the ethics in research I mean mm. so that's that's all I think thank you thank you so yeah, we can maybe add, see if Diana wants to say something or we can we can um uh, make this question later when Diana is with us. But my understanding is people don't have to take, I mean, also, I mean, the same from UK, if students have to do yeah, ethics as part lecture, as part of their uh, dissertation module. And, but then there's about them learning on their own through doing it. And that is out of information. So they don't have to do a certificate, but there is very clear um, uh, information in the online form about what each question means and additional documents explaining it. But uh, training is important, but it needs to be a training which is uh, respecting the reality of life because sometimes some, some of these trainings are, are really much about privacy confidentiality at all costs. So it's important if you do get training that is not done with assumptions, assumptions that people with mental health issues are incapable to, to make choices for themselves, assumptions that what people want is privacy confidentiality in all situations and the assumption about what benefit means, what risk means. Uh, so it needs to be done also in a very culturally sensitive way. So my recommendation is if CPMH or UGM uh, starts developing training um, to develop ethics using what has been done in other countries, but making your own. Because as anything else, ethics are based on values and cultural norms. And these are different the culture, different cultural contexts. So we cannot just take uh, some ethics stuff done in Australia and UK and America and assuming that that's what ethics is about because it doesn't work in that way. It's very, you know, it's very historically is changing. So it's very based on history and context. Uh, so yeah, that's my, my, my recommendation to CPMH and, this, and the UGM if you are going to go along um, this, this path. Anyway, so ne next, next slide. Please, Bulan. Okay, um, so again, that's, that's what I was saying just right now, was about participants should ideally be respected. Um, but this is not only about research participants, but also as authors and owners of their images. Uh, and like in this case, obviously, again, it's not always possible because in some situation, people might just have no way to share the images they have. But like with uh, Anto, now I'm not going to use you because you are there, but in the, the example, and you can watch Anto's beautiful film on uh, the movement website, maybe at the end, uh, Bulan in the chat, you can put a link for the for, for Anto's film, or Anto, you can put it yourself if you wish. Um, but uh, in the case, the film became something which is uh, um, edited together and is co-owned. So Anto is as much of an owner of the film as I am, and he has complete full uh, um, uh, freedom to do what, what he wishes to do with the film. So that's a thing that again, is an ideal situation is the case. So we can co-own, so we can use it for our research purpose but also the people who are part of the film can also use for their own purposes. 
researchers should discuss the benefit uh, of the, uh, the potential drawback of anonymizing visual data. And I think there's something that we don't have much time to do, but I think we should really try to, to explain not only the risk, but also the benefits, because often we, we focus on what are the risk of disclosure, which is extremely important, but also then try to make the person understand the benefit, potential benefit in terms of uh, their um, uh, uh, impact that the, the sharing the story can have uh, and make sure the person fully understand both and make a decision based on the knowledge of both, not only one or the other. But again, after we've done, done all of that, unless a participant chooses to be identified, they should be anonymized and their personal information should remain confidential, okay? So that's obviously always the case. Next slide. And the last point, okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Anto, for sharing the project. In terms of audience and dissemination, the primary focus uh, of uh, usually all ethics code, including the British one in this case, but Australia, every other context, is on participants, research participants. But as I mentioned in the beginning, I just want to remember that we also have to think about audiences. So to like uh, uh, make sure that we also are not uh, potentially negatively impacting audiences. And like in Breaking the Chains, the film I, I showed before, um, the, the main film, which is a full-length film based in, uh, in Chanjur in Indonesia, the beginning of the film, is, I, I, there is a warning, a very clear warning that the film shows some distressing images. And when I've done film screening, sometimes I've told people if there is anything in the film is upsetting them and they need to leave the room, that they can leave the room and come back when it ends. So I think it's important for people to be aware uh, that these are sensitive, some films, some content can be sensitive so that they can make a choice not to be exposed to them. Next. Uh, this, I guess, I already, already uh, covered. Um, uh, participants should ideally have the right to be consulted on uh, and to consent to the final form of the visual data. Uh, again, I say ideally because it's not always possible. For, for sometimes for like a very, very un uncontrollable thing, like now I was supposed to be back in Ghana and come back also to Indonesia um, and potentially, you know, be in Ghana for sure, be able to go back to where I filmed some of the people, but that won't be possible. But also sometimes we need to, we should have additional research fundings to be able to then return to the country uh, or for the research team to be able to go back. And sometimes people just cannot be uh, traced again, okay? So this cannot be done all the time, but ideally, like in the case with Anto, where it was possible for us to be in regular contact um, until the last moment when we released the film last April, um, uh, Anto had a full choice about, about what he wanted to do, show which part of the film footage you wanted to show and the final okay to be able to release the film. So in an ideal scenario, that's what we will do. Okay, next. So yeah, there's a number of, of, of resources. Of course, you can write them down now, but in the paper I mentioned before, you will find uh, a lot of resources um, we have collected so far. So if you want to know more, uh, please do uh, get the paper um, and also uh, sign up to the movement.org website because you can have updates around projects and uh, um, yeah, learn more about the visual methods if it's something you are interested in as I hope you are. Next slide. And then just uh, a good example of using uh, some kind of participatory methodology where people produce stories about themselves, um, uh, perhaps with the technical support of others, like in the case of Anto's story myself, but also other films. We invite you, maybe uh, Vulan, if you can write the, um, uh, the web website uh, the, to, to book a ticket. Second and final set of participatory video we have produced as part of Together for Mental Health project. Uh, so you can have an example there about using um, short videos in this case, so digital stories um, uh, or, or, or short films for uh, sharing uh, experiences. It was a collaboration with the KPCI and was part of the Together for Mental Health project, which, as uh, uh, Diana mentioned, is, uh, was also King's College London and University of Ghana. Uh, so you can uh, join us in the speakers and Diana will be there as well again and also our research fellow Asti. Um, so and uh, please come register and uh, hope to see you on the 26th of February. And then the last slide, Bulan. So if you can put the link, I don't know if you already have, but for people for registering. And the last, uh, yeah. 
Okay, and then the last one. Uh, it's free. Yeah, it's free, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it is free. <laughs> and a call for paper for a handbook and online conference in visual psychology. So as you said at the beginning, you know, I never heard this word before. And because I think we are actually kind of establishing this sub discipline of ourselves, because we feel the need as psychologists to be able to look um, at our own practice within um, uh, psychological, psychological theories, some methods for psychological research, including mental health. Um, please go in the movement website, uh, submit an abstract uh, for both for, for the handbook as well as for the online conference, which we are aiming to do this uh, September, although we have to see how things go. At the moment, everything is always to be confirmed. Um, but yeah, just yeah, to let you know, you can read, read more information in the website. So that is, was the last slide. So if you want to stop sharing, then we can see, I don't know how much time we have, to be honest, but we can see um, if is, uh, there is any question, if a comment before, before we close. Yep, we still have 13 minutes. Uh, Bapak Ibu bagi yang ingin bertanya, dipersilakan bisa bertanya di kolom chat atau bisa bertanya secara langsung. Silahkan. Oh, can you see the question, Amy? It's a long one. Uh, let me see. Thank you so much, Terra. Is that a question? It's a very, very important question. It's something that, again, you know, something that we are kind of um, still learning. There is not much best practices. As, as I mentioned before, one idea possibility is uh, okay, in my own, all my research, there is always uh, the, somebody locally that is working. And, but, you know, and so that's always the best way. In this case, like Asti, um, Photographic Mental Health Project, I know she's been, she's been in touch, in contact with the key people in the, the, the sites. Um, so there is um, a, a way to keep in a regular contact to also see that something changes in the situation. Like some, you know, we know also in Ghana, if one of the people involved in the research became unwell, uh, we sometimes can make decisions thinking, okay, maybe the person, uh, you know, do should we protect their identity further because maybe they at the moment are not very well. So we need to uh, have somebody definitely locally. As you mentioned, even somebody is locally, they must still not be living in the same place. Um, and uh, although that's the case, usually there is somebody who lives in the place, let's say, for example, in Flores, we've done our research even if uh, uh, nobody lives there, but the key people we have involved in the project, which were like the was then uh, they might be able, uh, they are in, in, in constant contact. So it's about having somebody locally who actually we know uh, that is uh, able to um, review consent, is able to, to check our participants are, are, if there is anything that we should be aware of. So that's one one uh, important thing. But the other one is around the, the initial consent. And that's why I think it is always important to make sure we um, uh, modality, what is gonna, more importantly, what is gonna be happening with the material we collected. Uh, because obviously, as I said, the once it goes online, if it is screened, in festivals or in teaching uh, is different than if it goes online. So when something is produced to go freely online, available to everybody, once it's there, we really have, have completely lost control uh, of, of the footage because we don't know what is going to be up uh, uh, the potential uh, um, dissemination and the person is uh, is okay with that. Uh, again, when we work in more rural area where people might be not educated, if they don't have a phone or a TV, we need to keep the, uh, make sure that we, uh, the person understands what they're agreeing uh, with. Sometimes what I, I do in this context, when I know that my person might not be so used to um, to, uh, to films and show them something, because even if it's not a TV, but seeing themselves reproduce again, um, kind of is the closest, closest experience to them be shown on a screen. Uh, um, and so taking time for that and also try to go back in the site. So when I do the research, you know, I, I don't remember any research actually where I've been somewhere only once. 
and uh, like Maurice and Baden never went back. So it's important to try to go back uh, to the same site, so, uh, so that the person is kind of has a chance to retrieve, to rechange the, their their consent uh, if they wish um, to do so. Uh, and yeah, and this also part part of the kind of staged consent uh, situation. When I say about taking time for doing this, obviously it's a bit tricky sometimes because if we take a lot of time before starting filming for the person, um, uh, can be disruptive for the for the for the uh, filming as well because uh, because maybe something is happening and then we we are unable to film it. So sometimes you know there are situations where maybe something was happening has been filmed, but then the person has been asked for uh, um, consent to use, otherwise the material will become deleted. Yeah, so maybe situation like this um, that happened, but uh, uh, this should be an exception. Um, in the most cases, when something is being planned, the person should be having enough time to be knowing in the local language, uh, but some somebody who can speak um, uh, fluently and, and be able to explain the concept properly, what the person is consenting to. It's a very long answer, but I hope it helps uh, to answer your question. A very long, but very, very important question, Terra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Apakah ada pertanyaan lagi? Oh. OK, thank you, Amy for your response, it's very important since we know that at some research time is our enemy. Okay, apakah ada pertanyaan lagi? <laughs> research time is our enemy, <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions? Bapak Ibu? Or, concept, or, or, or comments? or suggestion, yes. anything they want to share? Other comment? Oh, here's the in Bahasa. I will, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. I will try to translate. Uh, I'm still trying to uh, understand and digest uh, how the official research approach in mental health uh, will be done because it's uh, a new inf relatively new information or knowledge for me mm -hmm. so i try mm -hmm. to imagine how the procedure and the tech technicality of the research the field work mm -hmm. the val data validation uh, data analysis with this mm -hmm. approach uh, maybe yeah. the pictures photos audio your films mm -hmm. and the link that uh, the link, uh, maybe uh, the shared link, uh, is helping so much for, for further uh, study. Okay. Yeah. And yes. It's, 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 yeah. It's hard to say in a, in a, in a few minutes about what, how does it work? Yeah, because obviously it, it takes time and and uh, to to be doing this. But I guess just to, to help a little bit understand better, um, in uh, this case, it would be, you know, in, in the way I, I done the research, I, I mentioned that the process has been around um, using mainly moving images, so like videos, uh, but also uh, still images, photographs, as the way to collect data. So it, doing the field work in a country, instead of just going there and asking people questions with the audio recorder and um, recording their voice, what they're saying, then transcribe, transcribing, analyzing, and writing a paper about that. In this case, I um, use the video camera uh, and the photo camera to, to collect data so that when I'm in the field, I, I you know after I've given permission and depending on the kind of permission uh, and consent people have given me, then I can I can uh, uh, film them. And then when I have the footage, as for Inya, the research process, and I guess it's a bit different from just doing a normal film, then it's about analyzing uh, the transcript to kind of to see maybe yeah, the kind of more general analysis, not very specific, but see what actually are the key themes that they've emerged, like for any other qualitative research. That's what are some of the key concepts that have come out and how, which, and, and then try to match visual material to be able to represent these themes.
So the choices has done mainly about what are the important concepts, what are maybe some examples about how the concept has been played out. It's not much about what are the most powerful part of the footage, what is going to be the most uh, visually appealing or aesthetically uh, catchy, which are maybe some maybe more decision made in, in, a, in a normal filmmaking. In this case, this is not really relevant. Obviously, it's, it's, it's also taken into consideration the final edits, but the important part is about what are the, the key um, psychological, anthropological uh, concept in this case, in our project that have emerged in a, uh, and how can we visually represent them? Uh, always reflecting about the potential consequences of representation and sometimes deciding to use some footage other than other because some footage can be more stigmatizing than other. And so keeping all this important matter um, in, in mind. Thank you, Amy. And there is one uh, other question about sampling. How do you choose your sample uh, for your research? Well, usually the sampling is something that is done uh, working locally. So there is always been some, you know, there's a kind of key stakeholders, like in the breaking the chains, um, it was the um, uh, the organization we were working with, with Nuramid, but as, as the head um, in a, in a Chanjur. So we, uh, I know I went there, met with them, we did a workshop, uh, a KSJ and uh, and uh, with uh, the Nuramid um, key team. We had a few days of workshopping, uh, have some ideas about what who they chose should be involved. So usually I work very much with the local stakeholder, whatever that is, for them to choose who they think they should be involved. And they, they and when they, they uh, my invitation is about in terms of uh, consent. So people who actually are able to consent um, that I want the story to be shared, but also about something about the story that is very important to to be shared. So the the the, the choice is not made by myself as a researcher, but it's made by the local people. Now with Asti, when we were doing a search for, together for mental health, we spent more than two months doing field work. Asti and Diana already went in the fields before and they made, they met the key stakeholders um, and the, the, the organization, like, you know, the, the healer or the mental health professional we were going to be working with. Um, so there was an initial contact. And then when I arrived in Indonesia, uh, we went back in the site. The, the relationship already started with these partners. Uh, we went back to also to Chianjur, where we were already continuing the work done before on breaking the chains. And again, it was the people um, we were working with who then had a local reference point, which is eventually the people for the support, who are the people who can keep us in touch in terms of somebody uh, wants to withdraw from the project. So the same people then are the ones who, who tell us uh, who, um, who they wish to involve. So it's done in this kind of uh, in uh, in this kind of way. So the choice is made by the local people because they're the one who are most likely to know why the uh, the people who have capacity to consent, but also whose story is important to share, and where they know that they uh, have a relationship and they can continue the relationship once once we leave the field, or in my case, they leave the country. Okay, thank you, Amy. And we still have two minutes. Any other questions or? Very, very, very good question, by the way. Thank you so much. It's a very good question, all of this, and very good reflective point for me as well. You know, it's something new, so I'm also learning. So your questions also help me to think about um, important matters. Okay. Uh, thank you, Amy. And maybe you have. Uh, we still have one minute left. One minute left. Do you have? like a closing statement, maybe? And I mean, what, what I want to say, I guess, but obviously, thank you very much, Diana, for inviting me to take part in this event and to perceive me also to be a visionary institution and being willing to uh, to have a conversation around the visual ethics. It's something I think very new. It is happening every day because right now with the COVID, but also before, but even more now, we communicate visually. There is a lot of images con uh, shared and taken. So we cannot not think about visual research ethics because that's, that is the future really. So I think it's, uh, as always, CPMH shows to be in the future as much as in the past and in the present. So thank you for uh, for being visionary, as I said. It's lovely to also have Asti here. So Asti, we didn't have time to also give you a chance to say something about the experience. We were chatting before, so we'll have to write up about our own experience. But, you know, I mentioned you several times and obviously, you know, all, all I think I, I, I mentioned in the research project as a number of people involved in them. And I thank you all uh, for also 
also so what I'm learning together with you because we are all learning together and also special thanks to Anto for popping in unexpectedly and be able to share his, uh, his, um, his experience which is always I think very important and I think the best way for moving ethics further in, in the future any any mental health uh, ethics is to actually ask people like Anto in this case or any any other participant in research to share their experiences because usually we write about ethics from the perspective of um, committees um, uh, which sometimes are also not, not even that research but they seem to often know what to do <laughs> although they actually are not in the field uh, or researchers but then we don't know from the experience of the participants and I think the best way to know is about having more participants uh, like Anto being involved in writing up and sharing with us what does it mean to be part of the process and what can we do better so that's my invitation for you all as well as inviting you to do visual research in the future because in spite of the complications of the ethics around it I still think it is one of the most powerful way to doing for doing research but also sharing research and I hope to see you all in Indonesia I miss you so much and I miss the country and I miss the food and uh, everything about your country and I hope you all well and take good care I hear the, the not good news but i hope i will hear better news soon and you all keep very safe thank you thank you so much amy for your insightful uh for your insightful session as it is new it's really new for some of us and uh, i hope it can enlighten uh our and our knowledge and maybe can uh, well, maybe we can try to do research with people in the past. Uh, Wulan, Wulan. Yeah, thank you once again. I hope so. Hello. Diana? Yeah. Uh, yes. Tadi, apa? Tadi, gambar tadi belum dijawab, Wulan. Hello. Yang mana, Bu? Hello. Ya, uh, yang tadi kan di depan ya. Nah, pertanyaannya kan siapa yang diambil konsen? Yang tadi loh, oh, saya yeah. nggak nunjukin ke yeah. Mbak, Mbak Asti mau cerita, Mbak Asti siapa yang di... Boleh, Bu. Yes. Uh, menjelaskan Terus. dalam bahasa Indonesia nggak apa-apa ya? Iya, kan Emi udah tahu. Oke. Okay. <laughs> Ya, jadi uh, terima kasih banyak Bu Diana. Uh, saya mungkin bisa mencoba menjelaskan karena saya pun hadir uh, di lapangan bersama dengan Ibu Erminia. Dan memang semua poin-poin yang sudah diangkat oleh Ibu Diana dan oleh Ibu Erminia tersebut paling sekali ketika kita uh, sudah sampai di lapangan, apalagi untuk uh, kompleksitas penelitian visual. Uh, ketika uh, konsen misalnya untuk dua foto yang uh, disuplikan di presentasi Bu Diana uh, tadi, itu keduanya uh, kita harus melihat pertama otonomi. Uh, Apa dia uh, oh ya, kok ada suara berulang ya? <laughs> Mohon maaf. Jadi uh, kompetensi serta itu kita harus uh, bisa menilai uh, apakah uh, memiliki kemampuan untuk uh, melakukan self determination untuk respect for person. Uh, tetapi di sisi lain kita juga harus merespek bahwa kisahnya itu harus di include. Maka uh, kita harus bisa melihat siapa saja uh, peserta di sekitarnya yang bisa memiliki kompetensi. memberikan konsen. Uh, maka kita dekatilah dalam uh, kasus yang foto yang sedang ditunjukkan ini uh, perempuan dengan uh, halusinasi yang sangat aktif uh, di uh, mau mere uh, itu kita tanyakannya kepada kakaknya uh, dan kakaknya itu dalam keadaan yang baik tidak ada uh, gangguan kompetensi maka kita menekankan bahwa kisah yang diangkat itu bukan hanya mengenai pasiennya, jadi kita tidak menyorot 
ini. Jadi benefitnya adalah melihat interaksi antara yang di sebelah kiri itu adalah uh, pat, seorang pastor yang membantu pasien ini dan di sampingnya juga adalah uh, frater yang membantu pastor itu uh, dan melihat uh, interaksi mas. Foto yang kedua, yang pasien yang dipasung. Ya, peserta uh, penelitian kami yang satu ini uh, juga tentu saja dalam keadaan halusinasi sangat aktif uh, dan uh, tidak dalam uh, kapasitas untuk memberikan konsen, maka kita meminta kepada uh, ibunya yang berbahasa daerah sehingga juga memerlukan Uh, saksi lain yang bisa menyaksikan pengambilan konsen itu. Jadi uh, mengapa uh, keduanya tetap diambil kisahnya? Karena seperti tadi Emi katakan bahwa kalau kita terlalu restriktif maka um, kita mengecilkan uh, nilai dari uh, kontribusi kisah mereka kepada penelitian kita. Dan uh, tentu saja jadi ini adalah bedanya antara kita hanya mengikuti epic secara prosedural, tapi juga uh, kita multi-stage melihat apakah uh, representasi yang yang kita dapatkan dari lapangan itu uh, bisa memunculkan uh, kemanusiaan dari uh, peserta yang walaupun dalam keadaan uh, atau itu kompetensinya kurang baik. Mungkin itu bisa uh, menjelaskan sedikit. Oke, terima kasih Mbak Asti. Jadi ada yang ibunya, ada yang kakaknya, tergantung kondisi gitu ya. Jadi eh, ya seperti itu yang terjadi di lapangan. Karena mereka dianggap tidak kompeten karena kondisi penyakitnya. Ya, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih.